So the first thing that people need to get through their heads and really think about seriously, and this is a hard question to ask, but it's the question that I was asking myself 10 years ago. I didn't phrase it this way, but it was basically, is the service that I'm providing right now worth dying for? Mm. Most likely the answer is no, but you are actually subtracting years from your lifespan by living in front of a computer that's documented by science that's not opinion. They've actually scientifically measured the length of your telomeres, which are the like, kind of like the end caps of your nerves, and they can measure lifespan based on those. And sitting all day long shortens your telomeres faster than smoking cigarettes or drinking soda. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Callahan here, founder of Become More Compelling, and you are listening to another episode of Become More Compelling Radio. And with that auspicious opening, I want to ask you a question. Between the hours of roughly 8 to 5, are you sitting or are you standing? And what kind of impact might that have on your long-term health, your creativity, and your ability to perform at a high level? We're going to answer that in this podcast. My guest today is none other than Zach Arnold. And Zach is awesome. You you probably have seen his work if you've ever watched the show Empire, the show Burn Notice, uh, if you've ever watched Glee, because he's an editor. And he goes in and edits those programs so that you can uh, uh, actually have a story that makes sense in and in a show that's good. So he's the glue that holds that stuff together. What I'm really excited to talk with him about today is um, Zach has been in the industry for 15 years. About 10 years ago, he struggled with a very uh, intense bout of depression. Uh, he was working like brutal 12 plus hour days, sitting down, editing. He's since come out of that and he has some really good strategies, really good tactics around how do you protect your creativity because that's your number one asset if you're trying to go further in your career, go further when it comes to social skills, maybe even go further when it comes to starting your own business. So this conversation is wide ranging. We talk about everything from meditation to diet to sleep. And the great thing about this conversation is that you're going to be able to walk away with some concrete tactics to immediately start optimizing your life. And conveniently enough, Zach's business is called Optimize Yourself. And I'm going to link to that in the show notes because you definitely want to have Zach on your radar. Look, we all have sedentary jobs, it's easy to just say, oh yeah, I'll do it later. But when you think about it, when you look at people that are in your same industry 10, 20, 30 years from now, and you kind of see what's happening in like just the way they look and in, in the health aspect of things, it really is an eye opener. And Zach's overarching goal is to make people healthier so that they can sit down on the floor and play with their grandkids. If this is your first time listening to Become More Compelling Radio, do me a favor, Go to becomemorecompelling.com slash go and sign up to receive email from me where I include videos, Q&As, podcasts, stuff I never share publicly because I would love to help you supercharge your people skills so that you can have a more compelling career, business, and social life. And without further ado, I'm so excited for this conversation. Here's Zach. Hey, Zach. How's it going? Awesome. I'm super, super excited to be here with you, Jeff. So to kick things off, what, what kind of coffee did you drink this morning? Oh, man, I had bulletproof coffee. What other kind of coffee is there? So I actually wanted to pick your brain about this. We're going to be talking about a lot of awesome stuff in in this podcast, but I'm actually, I've got the supplies ordered for my first cup of bulletproof coffee. How is it? Like, what should I expect? Uh, Well, the first time that I had bulletproof coffee, and mind you, I have never been a coffee drinker my whole life. I had never had a single cup of coffee until I was about a month into having my second kid and I couldn't even function. And I'm like, maybe I should try this like coffee thing that everybody else on the planet does except me. And coffee wrecked me. I'm super, super sensitive to caffeine and I hated drinking coffee. I was jittery. I had massive crashes in the afternoon and I stopped it after about a month. 
But then I heard about Bulletproof Coffee and I'm like, huh, it's interesting because it kind of lessens the effects of the caffeine. It absorbs into your system more slowly. Let me just try this thing out. I was experimenting and it was like drinking rocket fuel for my brain. And the first day, I'll never forget this experience where I was driving in my car and it was almost like I had taken the limitless pill. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, like I am awake. I have ideas, right? I don't even know what to do with the ideas in my head. And then I got to work. I'm like, is this what normal? people feel like and from there it just went i mean i've i've become much less sensitive to it now but it's still something that i probably do depending on my workload maybe three or four days a week um but yeah it's i mean it's for me it's it's one of my staples if i have to be creative during the day man that is uh that's awesome I can just or have energy at eight o'clock at night for a podcast because i only have the one cup in the morning and i'm still you know focused and ready to go 12 hours later so yeah and kind of as a side note like uh i don't know if you've read dave uh dave asprey's new book headstrong but i'm no not yet i'm about three quarters of the way through it um pretty good so far uh although it does have the side effect of like it makes you think everything i'm doing is wrong and so i'm trying yes. to reconcile that fact with he has that tendency else. Dave is a is a mad genius, and some of the things that he does are amazing, and some of them are really kind of off the beaten path, and you have to take them with a grain of salt. And I'm 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 definitely not like a Dave Asprey groupie where everything he says is gospel, but he's got some real winners, and Bulletproof Coffee is just a, a grand slam home run. Ooh, nice. So uh, <laughs> I guess before I get way off on a, on a tangent, so what I'm excited to talk to you about today kind of how how can how can like someone who is sort of stuck at that like I'm sitting down for 8 12 hours a day um, how can they feel good at the end of the day what are some strategies they can use to to just feel better and maybe even sleep better and uh, and we're going to dive into all that but what I actually want to know first is what what's your story because most 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 folks that are where you are uh, they're probably not thinking about like uh, the right kind of mat to have um, next to my standing desk so that I can uh, kind of roll up my feet and feel good. Like, like what was your journey like for that? Yeah, well, the, the, the first thing that I tell anybody is I am not an expert. So if you have already recorded and written and edited the intro and it says I'm an expert in XYZ, you got to change it because <laughs> I am not an expert. I I'm close. I'm almost okay saying I'm an expert in film editing because I have done it for almost 20 years, won awards, worked on big shows, but I still don't feel like I'm an expert. When it comes to health and wellness, I'm on the same journey as everybody else, but I'm fanatical about learning as much as I can, experimenting and sharing my findings, whether good or bad. So I'm just on the same journey as everybody else. And my journey started a little over 10 years ago. I was editing my first independent feature film and it was a crazy schedule. I was getting paid no money. I was doing it all for the experience. And there was a stretch where I was working with the director seven days a week, 16 hours a day. And that is not an exaggeration for about six weeks straight and even worse. And it sounds like it wouldn't be as as bad, but I was doing it from home. So that meant that I woke up. I walked 15 feet. I sat at a computer for 16 hours in a very stressful situation with somebody I didn't like working with on a project I didn't like, mm. walked her to the front door at 1 a.m. every day, slept for six hours, woke up again, and did that for six weeks straight with no days off. And it basically led me down the path to suicidal depression, massive anxiety attacks. Um, there was one night, I will never forget this memory, where I was basically sitting in my little tiny edit suite, I called it, but it was really just a glorified closet with a computer. Uh, it was dark, and I'm just sitting there with my head in my hand saying, I cannot live like this anymore. And I even remember another moment where I was living with my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, um, and we have kids together. But this is way back in the early days. And she, all she did was she said something along the lines of, hey, can you take out the trash? And I just broke down crying. That's how overwhelmed and anxious and depressed I was. I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I had spent years before that heavily involved in athletics. I did strength training. I played football. I was in martial arts for seven or eight years by that point. I had a black belt. Um, I had learned meditation. I had learned yoga. But once I moved to Los Angeles to be a film editor, all of that was kind of under the category of I'll get to it when I can. But I'm so single-mindedly focused on succeeding that I forgot all of that. And when I went through this period, I said, 
what if I took everything I know about high performance athletics and I blend it with creative work at a computer? Is that even possible? And at that time, the idea wasn't synthesized as clearly as it is in hindsight. But I thought, what if I stopped treating myself like a Ford Pinto and I start treating myself like a Ferrari, like I'm a high performance machine? What would it take to do that but still deliver my work and live in front of a computer? And that journey lasted for years and years and years. And then I guess it was about three, three and a half years ago that it really started to gel. And it was people were noticing people in my industry would come to my office and see all the fancy contraptions in the standing desk. And they'd see that I was really energetic and I was sometimes juggling two jobs and they would always ask, how, how is this possible? And I'm like, oh, maybe I can start sharing some of the things that I've been learning and researching. So I was like, I know what I'll do. I'll start a podcast. They're not hard. You just record an audio file and put it on iTunes. That can't be that hard. Anybody that does a podcast is laughing their ass <laughs> off right now because I mean, it's a pain to do a podcast. I but mean, I thought, yeah, easy. Just, yeah, just doing just doing the artwork and getting like the right pixels and like all the little minutia stuff. Uh, yeah, can, everything can confirm. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's just a grind. But I know if I'd known what I was getting into, I never would have done it. But it was like what was happening is I was being interviewed on other editing podcasts as a guest, and they would say, "What do you want to talk about?" I'm like, "Oh, I would love to talk about you know I'm using a standing desk and I have a treadmill and blah blah blah." And they're like, "Yeah, we just kind of want to talk about editing and your career." I'm like, "Well, but that's all I ever talk about." So I'm like, I'm going to share the story on my own podcast on a whim, and I really thought that people were just going to kind of laugh at me. And it started to explode in my industry and people were saying, nobody's talking about this. Like nobody is putting our health first. Nobody's providing us these strategies. And these people that found this program are just desperate for more information. So I went from, well, this is kind of a whim and a hobby to how do I actually turn this into something? And from there, it was just like throwing gasoline on a fire and it just has grown. And now I've it's turned from what it was into the Optimize Yourself program, which goes well beyond film editors. But um, it really just started with me being in a place that so many other people are, which is basically, you know, slowly dying every single day stuck in front of a computer. Mm. Yeah, that that is a powerful story. And, you know, I'm just thinking of like, it's so it's so common. It seems like almost in every industry, like people just really treating themselves poorly, like treating themselves um, in a in a way. I mean, they wouldn't treat their friends that way. They wouldn't treat a family member that way. They wouldn't they wouldn't let a family member treat themselves that way. But for for some reason, I mean, I see all the time we tend to kind of be our own worst enemy in that way. Yeah, and the, the, I guess one of the things is that let's say that you have a family member that wants to be a trapeze artist or they want to be, you know, a, a BMX, you know, jumper that jumps these huge, um, like dangerous stunts. They're like, oh my God, that's so dangerous. You shouldn't do that. The problem is that being sedentary and working long hours is a slow, silent killer, but it's the fourth leading cause of death globally across everything. AIDS, cancer, accidents, like being sedentary is the fourth leading cause of death. But because it happens slowly, nobody really thinks about it until it's too late. And even when something does happen, nobody's ever going to have a massive coronary, have a heart attack, have a stroke, whatever it is, and think, oh, gee, you know, I've been sedentary for the last 30 years. So people don't think that way. So it's a slow, silent killer that nobody realizes is a huge problem. Mm, yeah. Um, and you know it's true like if if you get to the point where you're experiencing those problems it's probably something like oh well i you should probably work on a time machine and go back 30 years so uh, what would you say to someone who's like you know they're in their 20s they're maybe even in, in their 30s and and they're they're in a, a sedentary job and and they then they know in the back of their head like they've read some articles they know like sitting you know is is not good for you but they don't really know where to start with that person, where would you tell them to start? Yeah, the well, the first thing I would do is say, don't expect you know a list of five quick things that you can do at your desk, which I will share some of those later, but that can't be the first thing you're looking for. That's the tactic. That's the how can I fix this immediately without the real foundation. So the first thing that people need to get through their heads and really think about seriously, and this is a hard question to ask, but it's the question that I was asking myself 10 years ago. I didn't phrase it this way, but it was basically, is the service that I'm providing right now worth dying for? 
Mm. Most likely the answer is no, but you are actually subtracting years from your lifespan by living in front of a computer that's documented by science that's not opinion. They've actually scientifically measured the length of your telomeres, which are the like, kind of like the end caps of your nerves, and they can measure lifespan based on those. And sitting all day long shortens your telomeres faster than smoking cigarettes or drinking soda. So there's no doubt that it's actually shortening your lifespan. So ask yourself, the service that I'm providing, is it worth dying for? The problem is that when somebody asks a question like that, it's like saying to somebody in their mid-20s, you should really be putting money in a 401k. And they're like, who cares? I'm retiring in 40 years. Like, I want to spend some money and I want to party with my friends. And they're not thinking about the long term. But you have to start establishing the right mindset early on because movement throughout your day is kind of like making small contributions to your health 401k that over time will have massive dividends if you continue to do it a lot. And that kind of brings me to the next question or the next thought process that somebody needs to go through, which is shifting the paradigm from, well, I need to find extra time to exercise during the day to I need to create habits all throughout my day, my regular office work day, where I move more. So they need to change that mindset to I am a person that moves throughout my day. And I always have to clarify because people ask, well, are you saying that exercise is bad for me and movement is better? No, exercise is clearly good for you if you can find 30 minutes to an hour to do some cardio, to do strength training, hit training, a kickboxing class, whatever it is, that's fantastic. The reality is if you work in an environment and an industry similar to mine, my standard workday is 12 hours. That's just my contract. And some people work even longer than that. So the excuse is, well, I know I should exercise, but I just don't have the time. And I was tired of making that excuse in my own life. And I said, all right, I'm just going to accept that I can't go to the gym and I can't carve out 30 minutes to an hour every day. But how can I keep myself moving and keep myself healthy? What habits would I have to create? So it's really first asking the very hard question and secondly, shifting your mindset away from finding time to exercise and instead changing your habits throughout the day so you're constantly moving and you're constantly active. Hmm. And, you know, it makes me think of uh, especially if you're creating a movement lifestyle that's that's built in, that's very much a, a system, not a goal. You know, you think about every every January when – or really every like February 2nd where people are like, oh, I didn't work out yesterday. Oh, and now they feel guilty about not working out. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Whereas the person who's actually built in like, yeah, you know, when I'm on conference calls, I get my phone and I walk around. That's that's what I do. And making making those things built into the kind of the machine that they already have running is, I mean, it's, e- it's easy it's easy to say, you know, might just be one of those things where if someone has never thought of this and just thought about how they can incorporate movement into their day, I mean, I could see a huge light bulb going off because the, the more you can build something into your routine, the more likely it is to happen and you're not going to get those roadblocks or those, uh, those thoughts of like, oh, I just got to make time for it. Well, no one makes time for anything. I have to schedule dinner with friends because – we have to put it on the calendar so that it actually means something. Yeah, and I, I, I certainly don't want to say that you should never set goals. But at the same time, I'm not a big believer in setting these lofty 90-day goals. But that's the way that the fitness industry structures it. They say, you're going to start this program and you're going to do all these exercises for 90 days. You're going to take it before picture and after picture and your life is going to change. And you know what? If you stick to it for those 90 days, you are going to get the results. I've done all the P90X programs. Like I've trained for Spartan races. I've done Tough Mudders. But it's always about that one goal that you you set. And as soon as you achieve it, if you achieve it, then you're like, all right, well, now I can go back to the way that I was living because now I'm healthy. But 92% of people don't achieve their health and wellness goals because they say, all right, well, I've done this for three weeks. I've been really consistent, but I missed this one day. So I failed. I'm just going to give up because now I didn't do the 90 days. And in my opinion, if you build in systems and habits, 
you can still create goals, but you always have those habits and systems to fall back on. So for example, like I was talking about how I deal with, you know, I dealt with depression 10 years ago. Like I still deal with that to this day. I just have a genetic history in my entire family of dealing with depression and anxiety. It's just part of who I am. But even when I'm at my worst, I can't set goals. I can't focus and I'm not achieving much. I have built in so many different systems throughout my day that without even thinking about it at my worst, I still get 10,000 steps in a day and 30 active minutes. And I'm, I, I don't feel like I have, but I know that I'm still moving because that's what just keeps the engine running. Basically, movement is the engine that drives your creativity and drives your energy. And you're not going to burn off 100 pounds by taking one walk every afternoon and trying to get more steps in your office. But it's a start. It's basically that first domino that if you start to control, will start to knock over much larger dominoes as you become Become more energetic and more confident. Yeah, I have to ask because I, I struggle with this myself. Like uh, ten thousand steps, it, it doesn't seem like that much on paper, but when you actually get out there and try it, it, it's pretty it's pretty challenging for me. Like, how do you how do you get to that number? I've heard yes. I've heard a couple of things, but I want to hear it from you. Sure. I mean, the, there are just a lot of very little, small rules and habits that I built throughout the day. And I'm not saying I get to 10,000 every day. There are some days where I'll work a 16 hour day and it'll be 11 o'clock and I'll think, man, I haven't done anything. And I'm like, holy crap, I have 14,000 steps. And then there are other days I'm like, oh, well, I only hit seven today. That's just the way that it is. Um, but even on my worst days where I just can't even get out of the office, I have people in there for 12 hours, I usually will hit at least seven or 8,000, which for most people, at least in my industry, they're like, I've never gotten that many ever. Mm. So, um, so really it's about choosing specific things and just setting rules for yourself. So you already mentioned one. My rule is if I'm on the phone, I'm walking doesn't matter what it is and it's just built into me to the point where I can't sit and talk on the phone because I've been doing this for so long. So if I have a phone call that I schedule with somebody and it's like a 30 minute call, you don't even think about the fact that you're moving, but it's actually generating more energy and it's improving your communication skills on the phone because you're more energetic. But over a 30 minute conference call, I'll probably get three to 4,000 steps and that's usually in the morning because I schedule all my calls in the morning. Um, I will habitually take at least one 15 to 30 minute walk every day. Usually I do it either after lunch or I'll do it in the afternoon during that slump around 4.30. And if I haven't gotten to it in either of those, I'll do it right before I go to bed for 20 to 30 minutes. That again will get me three to 4,000 steps. And then what I'll do during my work day, if somebody's thinking, well, there's no way I can set aside one second to do anything. Another rule that I will set, is that I will, wherever I'm working, I will park as far away as possible. So an example would be on the the TV pilot that I just finished working on, they got me like premium parking where it would have been like 100 steps from my parking spot to my office. And I told them I don't want it. I said, give it to, you know, one of the office assistants that has to park, you know, in the, the structure that's all the way across the lot because I'm on the, the Universal Studios lot. And it's probably half a mile at least from my office door to where I park. But I chose that voluntarily because that's part of my identity. The fact that I want to move throughout the day is just part of who I am. So I didn't even have to think about it. I was like, no, no, you give the spot to somebody else. I'll continue to park in the back end of the lot. So that's another one that I will do. Um, unless I have no choice, I always take stairs. Uh, I don't take the elevator. And there's there's a deeper reason for that that goes into um, the documentary film that I did about the first quadriplegic that became a licensed scuba diver. Um, I won't go too deep into that. It's called Go Far, the Christopher Rush story. And if you want to link to the trailer, I can send it to you. Yeah. Um, but he never walked in his entire life. And he had to have elevators everywhere that he went. And the more time I spent with him, the more time I thought, well, I can take the stairs. So why the hell don't I? And that's just kind of part of who I am, that if there are stairs, I take them. So I probably do, because I make that choice and I park in parking structures, I get at least 10 to 15 flights of steps in a day. Um, so just parking further away, taking the steps, making sure that I walk while I'm on the phone, and just taking one walking break a day, that's enough to almost get me there. And then another one that I will do is I drink a lot of water during the day. And if you drink a lot of water, guess what you have to do? You got to get up and pee a lot. Yep. So I will, you know, just go from my office and go to the, the bathroom. But a lot of times I'll choose a bathroom on a different floor. 
So for example, the lot that I'm on now, I'm on the second floor, so I just walk outside, I walk down the steps, and I go in the lobby, and I go in the bathroom on the first floor, it's not a big deal, but it probably adds, I don't know, 300 steps every time I do it. If I've got to pee five times a day, that's 1,500 steps just going to the bathroom. So there's a whole lot of other ones that I could go into, but it's just really about thinking to yourself, I don't have time to exercise, but how can I take things I already have to do and just be more active while I'm doing them? And that's much more approachable for people, and it's much more immediate where you're not thinking – I hate exercise, I've been dieting for 30 days, I'm miserable, but I'm gonna make it to the 90 day goal, where instead, within two to three days, people report to me that they have more energy in the afternoon, they get home and they're more present with their family, just because they're moving, they're not even exercising yet, they're just moving, but it has a profound impact on their energy levels and also on their creativity. That's a perfect segue, because I I remember a few few months ago, uh, we had had chatted over the Facebook, and uh, I was telling you that, like one of my favorite things is to pop on an audio book and take like a, like a 20 to 30 minute walk. And, you know, it's funny, like, because we can all, we can track this stuff now, um, in the 21st century, like we can, we can quantify like how many steps we've gotten. We can see history so we can see when we're active, when we're not active. And, and I would just noticed on, on the days that I like really was not active, like, I mean, I felt bad. Like my like my mood was subdued. Uh, you know, you, I, like I don't know about you, but I would start to go into like big existential questions. Like, what am I doing? Like, it's just it's funny how just lack of activity for me personally. It's a direct corollary to uh, just how I how like I am and how I feel. And I mean, I think you hit the nail right on the head. Yeah, and that, that's all science. I mean, people say, well, you know, that's how I feel, but I'm thinking that's just the way the human body is designed. If you don't move and you're sedentary, think of yourself like a swamp. Your body, your lymphatic system, your circulatory system, it's just kind of sitting there. It's not really moving. And if you're sitting like with your legs actually at a 90 degree angle, your lymphatic system just shuts down. And for those that don't know what the lymphatic system is, it's kind of like the sewer system for your body that detoxifies all the crap that's going in your body, whether it's your diet, it's pollution in your environment, it's EMF waves from all the wireless that's all around us now, your body has to constantly detoxify. And if you're sitting, you can't detoxify your system. So that's why you literally start to feel like crap. But as you move more and you habitually move throughout the day, you actually increase the release of all the key neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, noroepinephrine that are going to help your mood elevate and help you be able to procrastinate less, be more creative. Like this is all science. This is not just, Oh, I just kind of feel better. There's a reason for it. So that's why building these habits into your day is so important. And another further thing that I want to say that I should have said before, but you'd mentioned the whole, like we're quantifying and we get 10,000 steps. One thing that nobody really talks about that I have found yet is the idea that you know, 10,000 steps, we have to get at this, what the American Heart Association wants us to get. But there's also this concept of empty steps where people kind of talk about empty calories. There's also empty steps. So if your goal is you want to get 10,000 steps and you're at 6,000 at 1130 p.m., so you walk for 45 minutes to hit your goal, that's pointless. The goal is to systematically get it throughout the day evenly. And the great thing thing is that there's now a separate indicator, at least through Fitbit. I think some of the other trackers do this now too, where it actually tracks your activity every hour. So you're trying to collect like the little check mark where if you've gotten a minimum of 250 steps every single hour, because if you were to get, I don't know, let's say 7,000 steps evenly throughout the course of a day, or you're sedentary for 10 hours straight, but then you get your 10,000 steps, the former is going to be healthier for you and not the latter because you're consistently moving and getting up. Mm. And yeah, like uh, I remember reading on your blog about like maybe it's a podcast episode where you kind of talk about the dangers of uh, kind of that, that like either 0% or 100%. Like it's better to be consistent. And if I – like when I was a kid, I, I watched uh, – there's this awful like Swamp Thing movie. And like I had like I had like the toys and everything. So now – Whenever I, I I feel like I'm sitting, I'm gonna think that I'm swamp thing, and I'm like, all right, I gotta move around, I gotta shake things off. But it makes me think of like the folks that that they might be sedentary all day, and then they hit the gym hard 
uh, either either before work or after work, and that that's that may not be the best play because if they haven't incorporated movement into their into their daily routine, then uh, I mean it just doesn't sound like it's good for the human body to to go from you know zero to a hundred. No, it it definitely isn't, and science is now proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that even if you exercise intensely for an hour a day it will not undo up to eight hours of being sedentary. So if you sit for eight hours and you do nothing and then you do P90X, P90X at 10 p.m. at night, and that was me for a long time, I was fit and I was strong, but I wasn't healthy because I wasn't moving throughout the day. So if your measurement of health is I am burning more calories than I'm taking in and I can bench press a lot and I can do a lot of sit-ups, that's not health, that's fitness. So if you're exercising, yes, you might be getting fitter, you might be developing more strength, more balance, more endurance, all of which are great. Again, I'm not saying that exercise is bad, but there's a difference between being fit and being healthy. And for me, I also want to be healthy because that means long-term living. That means longevity. That's about can I live longer? Can I sit on the floor with my grandkids and play with them? Or am I going to be in a nursing home all hunched over? Like everybody's seen, you know, the older people with the walkers. That's because you're sedentary for your whole life. I don't want that. Mm. So I'm 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 playing a game of chess, not a game of checkers. But again, I also exercise and I like to, you know, get stronger and compete and stuff. But they're two completely separate things. And that's really the big paradigm shift that most people don't realize even exists. And and what's funny, you say like the old person in the walker, like that's one of my greatest fears is like being one of those old people that just like can't function. So I mean, that's that's reason enough. Like one thing one thing I love about you, Zach, is is uh, you've, you've talked before about you need to have the why. Why are you doing this? And every person's why is going to be a little different. And it sounds like your why is you want to you want to play that game of chess so that you can, you know, sit on the floor with your grandkids and actually play with them and have a good time. So I think I think that's super important because uh, it, it almost kind of harkens back to intrinsic motivation rather than extrinsic uh, motivation. So you're more likely to do something if there's a good, solid reason behind it. And I, I absolutely love that. Yeah, I mean, having that deeper why is kind of paramount to achieving any goal that you want to because you're always going to run up against hardships. Things are always going to be annoying and take longer than you think, and you don't achieve the goal that you wanted to. But if that deeper why exists, then you're going to be able to overcome those hardships. But it's really important that you not only have that kind of big picture deeper why, like for me, I want to make sure that I can you know, be 75 years old and sit on the floor and play with my grandkids. But that's not enough to get me to do this stuff every day because again, it's like putting money in your 401k. It's like, oh, I'll get to it eventually. But the other one is that I want to be able to come home at night and have the presence to play with my kids now. And that's immediate. So if I have even one or two days off where I get off my routine and I'm super lazy and I sit on the couch all day, I'm just annoyed with my kids at seven o'clock at night. And that's not fair. And I'm like, that I just I'm I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go back on the routine tomorrow. Like that's a deeper why that will get you moving immediately, as opposed to just always thinking long term. Yeah, kind of having that short term, long term kind of barbell effect. Um, a goal that I have for 2017 is to is to meditate every day. And and one thing that because I noticed when I would sit down to meditate, like for the first one minute, like I would just really not like it and just be like, oh, why am I doing this? But then I would think like, I'm not doing this for the immediate payoff. I'm doing this for uh, myself later so that when I look back, I can I can really thank myself for taking this time and kind of recharging the battery so that I can perform at a higher level. Yeah. And I think that meditation is the perfect example of something where you know, if, if let's say that you get on the, the, the bike for 30 minutes, that is an immediate effect. Like you feel the endorphins and you feel great. And yet if the first few times you do it, you're going to be tired. You're going to be sore, but there's an immediate effect, but it's the kind of thing you have to do consistently over and over and over again to keep that effect with meditation. You might do it and you're like, okay, I don't get it. Like what's, what's the big deal about meditation? I sat here for 10 minutes and there were some chimey bells on this one app that I'm using. 
I don't, what's the big deal? Like I've, I've dealt with people that are like, I just don't get meditation. Well, how long did you try? I don't know. I did it like twice. It didn't work for me. It's like, oh, mm. like meditation is so paramount if you want to maintain presence with people. And it's not just about, you know, trying to find your oneness and becoming an, an enlightened being. And I'm one with the trees and the wind and the earth. Like if you just want to be able to have a communi- if you want to have a, a conversation with somebody, whether it's a colleague, whether it's in an interview, whether it's with your wife or your husband, whoever it is, if your mind is bouncing all over the place, like you've got ping pong balls in your brain, you're not going to be able to focus on that one present moment. Meditation is basically training for that. So if you want to train for an endurance event, you do P90X. If you want to train for presence with important people in your life and you want to be able to communicate with them honestly and really have them feel like the only thing in the world right now that you care about is them, meditation is the tool to do that. And one thing that I've learned in my industry, which um, most people just kind of think is – they don't even think about it or consider that this could have anything to do with my success. But I think it has a huge part to do with my success. They assume it's because I'm really good at editing and the software and I have a background in movies and film theory. But really, everybody that works with me says the same thing. They say, I just – I completely trust you. Like you're always in the room with just me. Mm. You're not on your phone. Like I just feel like you're protecting my project. You're you're listening to me, and I've never had that experience with other editors. And because of that, I'm always the top of their list when they have a new project. That's not because I went to film school. That's because I've taken up yoga and meditation and learned how to be present in the room with people. And in a creative industry, most people are so rampant with ADD, they don't even know what that experience feels like. So it's just like this giant tidal wave of like, wait, I'm really calm when I come in this room that's weird. Why do I feel that way? And they don't realize it's very intentional in the way that I set up my room and the way that I just create the type of presence that I have when I work with them. Okay. So there's so much that we have to dig into. Like, I feel like I'm you taking the limitless pill, uh, driving down the 401 or some other California highway. So that's such a key point. This is something that there are two things to this. So I'll, I'll, we'll see if we can take him, uh, in order. So the first thing Yes, meditation, huge game changer. And I mean, I do it. I, I, I'm, I'm very decidedly non-spiritual about it. Like I'm very much like I, I just want to uh, manage my emotions in a way where I mean, manage might not even be the right word. It's more like it's almost like surfing, like like you're not stopping those emotions. Those emotions are still happening. Uh, just being able to ride those waves as they happen and realize that, hey, you know what? That's going to pass like that feeling. It might you might have a spike like it's something I call a cortisol torpedo, uh, where you might just feel a sudden pang of uh, anxiety or nervousness. Maybe you're talking to your boss about a new project that you've never done before, whatever it might be. But if you can let that subside and then bring yourself back to the, the present moment, then you can actually connect with whoever it is that you're talking to and form those relationships and make them feel comfortable. Because the second thing, and this is, I mean, this is the future right here. And I think that you are right on when you say like these folks that are bringing you work because they've worked with you before because you made them feel comfortable and taken care of and they have a great rapport with you i mean that's a direct benefit of every all the work that you've put in and it's it's building a relationship for future collaboration which means that you're going to get work pretty much until you don't want it anymore yeah, and it's it's such a huge part of what I bring to a project, and it's so it's funny that we're talking about this. Um, I just started a new show a couple of days ago. Well, it's another season of a TV show I've already worked on, but I started a new season of it, and I just showed up, and I was unpacking my office, and one of the colleagues that I worked on the first season, they're just like, you know, I've been just kind of freaking out and been kind of worried, but it's weird. Now that you're here, <laughs> I feel like we're going to be all right. And I was like, that's bizarre, but then I thought about it. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that's – that's kind of my thing. That's what I do. Um, but it's it's really, really important to people, and they don't really understand how that works. But it really does come back to a meditation and a yoga practice. And when you said the word spiritual, that, to me, is the giant barrier for most people that freaks them out. If, if you want to make meditation a spiritual thing, by all means, go for it. However, you can really make meditation as clinical in your mind as doing squats or doing the, the chest press or whatever the 
the exercise might be at the gym, meditation can be seen the exact same way because what you're doing to your brain function, what you're doing to the process of your synapses firing, how you react to anxiety, how you process thoughts, how you create decisions, it is scientifically proven that you are rewiring your brain through meditation. So if you have no interest in the chimey bells and eating granola in the sunset <laughs> and you just and you just want to use meditation clinically to rewire your brain, that is a way that you can get around that huge barrier because it is the same as exercises just for the way that your brain fires. So it is so essential to any person that is interested in in figuring out what what are, what's in that that toolbox that I need to not just kind of have a job but continue to move up and be successful and actually be somebody in my industry I just don't think you can do it without having some form of a meditation or a yoga practice and you know it's funny like I feel like I feel like only in the last maybe maybe 10 years or so that mind body separation myth has kind of been dispelled at this point i think we can most everyone can agree on that but yeah like like treat your mind like it's a part of your body because it it is like that it's directly connected to everything else and i think the more people can just and especially like let's face it we've all got a little box in our pocket that is is effectively a uh, a presence breaker the more you can kind of stop feeding uh, kind of the Labrador Retriever to uh, borrow to uh, borrow a Dave Asprey term in Headstrong, uh, the more you can kind of ignore that part of it and just sit with yourself and examine your own thoughts, then you are going to perform at a higher level. The things that the the, the things that used to throw you for a loop, and and and, and this is the big takeaway for me because I used to work in a um, a job that was pretty stressful, you know, pretty high stakes, and um, a lot of times, like you would just have to manage your own emotion without um, without letting people see that you were visibly flustered. And so, I guess probably three or four weeks after I took up meditation, like I was just noticing that like there's just kind of this calm where I felt like you know what, yeah, all these things are still happening, but I can kind of set it on I can kind of set it on on automatic pilot, and I don't feel the same stress that I used to. So there, there was a really profound shift for me. I mean, it was probably two or three weeks into it. Um, so yeah, to those that have said like, oh yeah, I tried it a couple of times or I tried it even four or five times, like try it more. And yeah, I mean, it's, what else it's, are you going to do? Check, uh, check Twitter for the 60,000th time today. You can, you can do something better. Yeah. And that it's, I, I've never had anybody that's accused me of, not accomplishing much or being lazy. That that hasn't really happened to me. I'm accused of being very intense, being an overachiever and being a workaholic. But I've never had somebody say, you know, you don't really accomplish much and you just kind of seem lazy and useless. But the, uh, the reason I bring that up, I'm trust me, it's not because I'm bragging at all. It's because I don't really use my phone. And I'm very productive and I get a lot of things done. And people associate being productive with using your phone as a tool and having all these different apps and all these different things. Like I call it a dumb phone because people have become so addicted to it and it's now coming out like they're doing scientific research that it is actually making us dumber mm -hmm. and making us less present and it's enhancing the, the ADD that everybody has. Like humans now have a shorter attention span than a goldfish. It's like <laughs> less than eight seconds. I'm serious. They really do. Oh, man. There's, a, there's a scientific study about that. But when people say, well, I don't understand how you can get so much done and keep up with your email and all these other things. And I said, I take all of it off my phone. I don't have social media on my phone. I don't have email on my phone. I basically use my phone as a calendar. I use it to call people and I use it to like, you know, manage my finances via an app, whatever it is. But I barely use the capabilities of my phone. And by not having that as a crutch, it forces me to be present with whatever it is that I'm doing. So it doesn't mean that I'm not on social media. But when I'm on social media, I am on social media. That's the only thing that I do. I'm doing, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, whatever it is that I'm doing, that's my task at the time. But I'm not saying, well, I'm going to get something done. And, you know, I'm doing email on my laptop, but I've got the Twitter on the, the feed on the phone. Like the human brain is not capable of multitasking. And for everybody that's thinking, well, I multitask, you don't.
Yep. Your brain is not capable of it. You are switching tasks really, really quickly, but that comes at a tremendous cost to your brain, and you're actually burning excess energy by doing that. So that's why at the end of a 12-hour day in front of your computer, you say to yourself, my God, I am exhausted. I don't get it. I haven't done anything all day. But you have done a lot. You've taxed your brain beyond what it's really – what it really wants to do during the course of a day because the brain is not wired to deal with all of these distractions. Like our genetic code is not caught up to the technology that's hit us in the last 20 years or so. And one of the biggest kind of aha moment, like just jaw dropping discoveries, which is really a small thing. But when I learned about it, I was like, oh my God, my entire life makes sense now. It's that the human brain is only about 5% of your total body weight. But it burns over 25% of your calories. As soon as I heard that, I was mm. like, I get everything that's wrong with me now. I totally understand. It never occurred to me that the brain was sucking so much of my energy because in my specific field, and if you're in any type of a creative field whatsoever, I make thousands of decisions a day. Mm. My entire job all day is making micro decisions. Should I choose this shot or this shot? Should I use this piece of music or this piece of music? Should it be one frame shorter? Should it be one frame longer? I do that all day long, and that's why even though I may have barely moved, I'm exhausted because I, my brain has been, on, you know, it's been in a spinning class for 12 hours. So once I discovered that, that's when I really rethought the way that I did everything. So now it's not about how can I burn calories to get thin. It's about how can I make sure that I'm providing the energy that my brain needs to fire at optimal levels. Mm. How, 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 how has that knowledge changed? Like, has it changed your eating habits? Like, because now you're tra- you, you've gone from a place of like, I'm trying to burn the calories, but now you're thinking like, hey, I got to feed the engine so I can perform at a high level. Oh, absolutely. When it comes to diet, I don't I don't like the word diet in the, the generic term of I'm going to go on a 90 day diet. For me, diet is lifestyle. It's about the choices that I make every single day. So I haven't actually been on a quote unquote diet for years. I used to try that and I've never been super overweight. I my weight has fluctuated in probably a range of about 15 to 20 pounds over the last 10 years. Um, but outside of that, I kind of stay in that same range. But what I do is I just decide, all right, like I said before, I don't want to treat myself like a Pinto. I want to treat myself like a Ferrari. Well, what does that mean as far as food? Well, there are just certain types of foods I don't eat if I know that I need to be creative and I need to be on point. That doesn't mean that I don't do it on a Friday night or a Saturday. Like, trust me, I eat a lot of crap when I don't need to be like, quote unquote, on. But if I need to be on deadline and I'm doing creative work, I avoid sugar like the plague. I don't eat any gluten whatsoever. And really what it comes down to is I'm trying to eat the lowest foods that cause the lowest amount of inflammation. So it's I'm I don't, paleo would be paleo is kind of a strict term. So I'm not paleo strictly, but it's pretty much eating. I eat a fair amount of nuts. I will if I have a plate for lunch, if I go to like a, like they have a cafeteria at Universal Studios that has a whole huge spread. So I'll basically have two thirds of my plate just greens and vegetables, but then I'll have some meat and maybe, you know, a little bit of rice or something. But for me, it's really about avoiding any sugar whatsoever and any gluten. Cause as soon as I have those, I can, like, the sound that my brain makes is just like, And I'm useless. I just – I can't make decisions. I need to take a nap. But like I said, that doesn't mean that on a Friday night or over the weekend, I'll have a piece of cake. I'll have a donut, like whatever it is. But I eat for maximum productivity and creativity, not because I'm counting calories. I love that. So uh, you're you're a self-described workaholic. Uh, Actually, I I pulled a comment from your mom on your blog – and uh, she she was – this is on the article that's uh, how total burnout led to the most productive year of my life. And I thought it was a sweet comment because uh, she, she was talking about how um, she she was going to tell your your dad about the blog post and is going to help him out. And he's like uh, being a workaholic kind of runs in the family for you guys. Um how do you how do you unplug at the at like the end of not just the actual day but like the end of your work day to to leave stuff at work that way you can come home and and either be present with your family or if you're going to meet a friend for drinks like how do you how do you wind down at the end of the work day 
Yeah, I mean, this this is a constant struggle for me. I, ha- I was on a podcast recently where one of the canned questions that the guest had was, what do you do to relax? And I was like, Ooh, I don't, I don't that's a know. That's question. <laughs> like, what, it's funny because relaxing is one of the most stressful things for me. Um, and that's just because my brain is always going. I'm always thinking of the next idea, the next thing that I want to write, whatever it is. So if I'm in active mode, I am just firing, I'm going ahead. On the weekend, sometimes I'll have these crashes, and it's not so much because I don't have the energy. It's because I don't have a task in front of me, and I'm like, but I should be doing something right now, and I don't know what I should be doing. And I'm just like, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to take a nap, right? So it's it. I'm like I said, I'm not an expert in any of this. I'm definitely not an expert on how to overcome workaholism. But what I've done is I've created strategies – and a few systems of their own that are about allowing my body and my mind to unwind near the end of the night so I make sure that I can sleep every night because that's a huge thing for people that are creative is their brain never stops. They'll say, I'll lie in bed and I'll kind of drift in and out, but I'm just constantly getting these ideas and thinking about the things I want to do the next day and I'm just so excited so they never get any sleep, which is so counterproductive to being creative. So I have systems that I will use to make sure that I pass out and I get deep sleep and I wake up refreshed the next day and I just kind of shut the system down. But as far as like just relaxing, like chilling is not something I'm very good at doing. <laughs> it's, it's very like even at the office, like they'll have margarita Fridays. I'm like, no, guys, I got to do this and this and this. And like, oh, yeah, whatever. So do you I'm, mean margarita I'm not crush really, it day. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to keep working. Yeah, so I'm not uh, I'm not terribly good at unwinding and relaxing. It's not. It's definitely not at the the top of the list of things I've mastered. Yeah, I think I think uh, I, I would. You, you're driving the boat. I'm I'm also paddling. Um, one one thing I can't remember where I heard this, but someone said um, re- reframing, uh, relaxing as recharging. And so I've tr- I've been trying to think of that and just like, you know, it's so so silly, but like. For me, like I'm a huge baseball fan, and and like I, you know, I'm 30 years old, so I, I I don't play video games like I did you know 10 years ago. But uh, having what I've dubbed for myself guilt-free gaming, uh, where I might just it might just be an hour or a half hour, just like sit down, play the game, and not feel guilty about doing that because what's that doing? It's actually it's serving a purpose. It's it's fun. I'm enjoying it, and if I feel guilty about, about recharging, whichever method that ends up taking, then then that sucked all the enjoyment out of that activity. And then I quit that activity and then I'm ready to go back into something and it, it just doesn't feel good. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what that's like. And I think that the one thing that I do that I try to do to relax, but is kind of counterintuitive is watching television. But the problem is that, and for most people, it's like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, get in front of the TV and zone out and have my popcorn. And like, that's just people um, basically being zombies. But for me, I can't even shut off then. Cause I'll be watching a show. I'm like, Oh, I love that technique. I love how they did that transition from this scene to this oh, scene. I have to oh, look, man. I have to look up what plugin they use and look, who's the executive. Produ- oh, you know what? I know that executive producer is friends with this person that I've worked with. I should really send them an email. It, it never stops. I can't even watch TV without Ooh. playing that game of chess. Like it never ends. Yeah. I could definitely see that for you. Like looking at different cuts and stuff like that. And side note, I have to tell you, uh, cause I told some of my friends, friends that I was going to uh, have you on my podcast and and uh, I know that you you did the editing on Burn Notice we we had a ritual where we would uh, get get some barbecue and some beers and watch Burn Notice back in the day uh, nice did you so, have a drinking game for it we we didn't but that would have been so awesome <laughs> oh, there are man. definitely some some good Burn Notice drinking games so um, yeah, you'll, you'll have to look up some of those. I've never played them, but I know that there are certainly, uh, some good ones. Well, you would have like an unfair advantage. Cause like you, you can say like, yeah, when there's, when there's a cut such and such, such and such, and, and people would be like, oh man, he, he knew that was coming. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's so awesome. And so, um, we are, I want to be respectful of your time, of course, but I did want to throw a couple rapid fire questions at you and see what you come up with. Are you ready? And, and and we haven't practiced these at all. You don't know what the what the question I'm going to ask is. Maybe, maybe not. Well, so. we'll see. I'll, <laughs> uh, I'll I'll see if I've primed my creative brain enough to give you any semblance of a good answer. Okay. So if you could send a text message to to everyone on on Earth with a phone, what would it say? 
So so basically, it's like a bulk text message. Like I send it, and it goes to everybody on the planet. Yeah, it's gonna go to everyone on the planet. What kind of words of wisdom would you want them to know? Hmm. Um. You can save fifteen percent on your car insurance. No, I probably use it for something better than that. Um, I think what I would do, and I'm not, I would have to think deeper about how to like properly phrase it because you know I'm, I also pride myself on being a halfway decent copywriter, and I'm sure the copy that I would write off the top of my head would suck, but it'd be something along the lines of, you are so much closer to achieving your goals than you think you are. And the reason is that when you study people that are at the tops of their field that are titans in you know, the investing world or the sports world or whatever it is, you look at the difference between the top of the top and then that next layer of people that are successful. It's like 1%. You know, like Michael Jordan wasn't 57% better than everybody else. He was like 1% better than everybody else. But that 1% makes a huge difference. And I think so many people just think to themselves, oh, you know, I'm I'm fat and I'm lazy and I just can't get stuff done. Like I'm such a mess and I'll never achieve what I want to. But if you just tweak a few small things, it's amazing how much progress can be made. So like one analogy that I like to use, and I realize this is probably way longer than you were expecting. But, I, love uh, it. I love it. Keep going. It, it, it comes with the ADD. It's very hard to just share one, uh, one, answer, one word answer. Um, but the, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Dodgeball. Of course. If you can, um, if you yeah. can dodge a, a wrench, you can dodge a ball. You can dodge a wrench. You can dodge a ball. Um, so I love the movie Dodgeball and, you know, they have the Globo gym with Ben Stiller and, you know, it's just, you know, all pain, you know, no pain, no gain, like all this stuff. But then there's this video with Vince Vaughn where he's like, you know what? You're pretty good just the way that you are. Like you're fine. You're blah, blah, blah. If you just want to lose a couple pounds, you want to meet a couple friends. Like I love that message where you don't have to start over from scratch. Like you have so much more foundation for success than you think that you do. You just need to make a few tweaks and all of a sudden everything can change. So I think that would be the the message that I would send just with much more succinct copywriting. Um, like so yeah, that. that, that would be the answer. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think in many ways, and especially if you're in a creative field, like, you know, if you're a copywriter, if you're an editor, if you're an entrepreneur, like <laughs> you are your own worst enemy and your own, you're, you're your own harshest critic. Like, for instance, when I release these podcast episodes, like, like I'll sit in the editing bay, you know, I'll, ed- I'll do my thing, I'll edit them, and then, um, you know, I might listen to them once, and then I kind of release them, and then uh, when I go back and listen to them later, I'm like, oh, I, I should have said this, I should have said that, I, I, you know, why didn't I do this? But then everyone that listens to them, of course, it might just be because they're talking to the creator of the podcast and they want to make me feel good. Uh, they're like, hey, I love your podcast. This is what I got out of it. And, and I'm like, wow, you got all that out of my podcast? Like, it's important to just walk the line between like, be, be nice to yourself, I think is maybe what I would send people at this point. Like, there's no reason to be super harsh on everything you do. Cut yourself some slack. Yep, I agree with that. And I'll like just one more tiny anecdote that goes with that. Not even an anecdote, just kind of a tip is that one of the the profound things that I learned as I was kind of going through my personal development journey, and I'm still on that journey, but just kind of learning productivity, there's this one really, really small trick that had a giant impact on my productivity. Oh everybody thinks everybody thinks that it's all about to-do lists and the things that you need to do. What you need to do at least once a week is look at the things that you've done. Because I would get to the end of the week and I would think, oh my God, I have so many things I need to accomplish next week. But then I would look at my list of the, like the completed to-do list and I was like, holy crap have I done a lot this week. Just that alone fuels your productivity for the next week, but it also helps you realize that you are accomplishing something even though you feel like you're on this hamster wheel and you're never getting closer to that goal. If you just take two minutes and look at the things that you did accomplish over the last week, it has a giant snowball effect on your productivity. That's, I mean, that's great because, I mean, I think I've always categorized myself as a type B, but I don't know if that's necessarily true anymore. Um, I'm not sure if you can switch those things up, but I mean, I very much am a future focused person. So um, I have, it's funny you say that because I have tried to carve out like, opportunities for myself to look back at what I've done uh, because for years and years I just didn't do that at all and it's just like what's the next thing what's the next thing but sometimes looking back is really really effective as well 
segueing into the the second question I wanted to ask you, what is one thing you think might be true that the rest of the world might find a little crazy? Oh man, I definitely. It's funny because I I read um, zero to one maybe like six months ago, and I know this is a question that Peter Thiel asks, and I remember listening to the book and thinking, man. How would I answer this question? And I guess I should have thought further because now, now I'm being asked it. And I'm not sure. I, and I think it's the same answer that kind of, you know, just subconsciously popped up into my head that also popped into my head like six months ago, which kind of aligns with the things we've been talking about, is that you don't have to exercise to live a long and healthy life. Um, and the science is now proving that. So I guess it, it, I wouldn't be called crazy anymore. And one more time, just third time's a charm, caveat, I'm not saying exercise is bad. I'm just saying that you can live a long and healthy life without going to the gym and doing the no pain, no gain lifestyle. You can do it by just building habits so you're constantly moving and staying active without taking extra time out of your day. I love that. And it just, it built on everything everything that we've been talking about, like, Make it part of your life instead of something that, that you just either dread doing or feel like you have to go 110% on. Because um, we, we, we talk about work-life balance. Well, we all kind of know at this point work-life balance is a sham. It's something that uh, companies sell us to uh, uh, make us feel good about spending 80 hours a week with them. Uh, ooh, that came out really harsh. Um, it's more about like, <laughs> well, in your case, like m- much, much uh, longer than 80 hours. Um, but it's really about like, you want to integrate the working side of your life with everything else, just like you'd want to integrate, just like you'd want to integrate the fitness side or the healthy side into everything else. Make it part of your routine. Yeah, and it's not even. I would say go one level further, and this is something that I do with people that are in my Move Yourself program, which is part of Optimize Yourself. I will tell them it's not just about the habits and the routines. That's clearly a part of it. You have to make a part of your identity. It has to be part of who you are because once you identify yourself as an active person, not somebody that exercises or trains, but as somebody that is an active person, you make different decisions without even thinking about them. Like when I got offered that parking spot, I didn't even have to think about it. My identity was, you know what, that's not something I need or something that I do, so give it to somebody else because it's part of my identity. Like it's it's almost like it's a value at this point. So if you can get to the point where it becomes part of your identity, then everything else falls into place. I love that. <laughs> There's been so much awesomeness in this podcast. We're definitely gonna have to do a round two at some point, but I want to ask you, where can my listeners and readers find more about you? Yeah, so they can just go to optimizeyourself.me. They will learn more about my Move Yourself program. They will, you know, they can learn about the podcast and the blog and all that crazy stuff. But that's all they have to do is go to that site, uh, optimizeyourself.me. And and what, um, just off the top of your head, like what's, uh, and we can link to this in the show notes, like what's one piece of content that would be a good starting point for them? Um, I mean, I, I, if they, uh, join the email list, I'll send them a, a document that'll get them started moving right away with quick ways that they can, you know, get more energy and creativity throughout the day. And then through, uh, through, you know, a couple introductory emails, I'll kind of help them navigate some of the content. But I would say that, I don't know the, the two that I direct people to the most, number one, I have one that's called your creativity is your number one asset. Here's how to protect it. And that's all about just the science of creativity and how you can maximize it, but also how you need to look at your creativity no different than, you know, your house or your car. Like these are assets you want to protect. You need to protect your creativity because that is what's supporting your family. So that's a big one. And then I think the the one that you mentioned is also a really big one, um, how total burnout led to the most productive year of my life. That's really kind of all encompassing as far as you learn a little bit more about my story, but there's also some really great actionable takeaways that people can get started with immediately. Man, I, I've enjoyed this conversation so much and there's so much that we haven't gotten to that we'll have to do at a, at a later date. Um, but Zach, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I, I mean, I've, I've learned a lot, and uh, I think I think the uh, folks listening to this can also have, have a great starting point to 
be more active, associate it with their identity, and uh, feel better at the end of the day and more present. And ideally, just being able to walk into the room like Zach and just being like, all right, it's going to be fine. So and so is here. <laughs> that's it. that's the idea. If you can get people to, to feel like you're their rock, they're going to hire you over and over and over again. If this is your first time listening to Become More Compelling Radio, do me a favor. Go to becomemorecompelling.com slash go and sign up to receive email from me where I include videos, Q&As, podcasts, stuff I never share publicly because I would love to help you supercharge your people skills so that you can have a more compelling career, business, and social life.